Welcome to Module 5 of DLS 105, Demonstration of RMC Total Risk. RMC Total Risk is a quantitative risk analysis software that performs risk calculations for dam and levee safety risk assessments. Following this presentation, participants should be able to demonstrate how to use RMC Total Risk to perform the calculations for a risk assessment. We'll begin the presentation by going through a few items of note that you need to be aware of before starting to use the program. We'll then jump into the software and go through an overview of the graphical user interface. Next, we'll walk through each of the different function types present within the software and finish by demonstrating how to set up a risk analysis. As we step through each component of the software, we'll enter example project data to provide you with a demonstration of how the software will be used in practice. Before we jump into the software, there's a few items that we need to note. The software is not currently approved for RMC risk assessments. The application is still in beta testing with a full release pending the completion of validation and peer review documentation. So you've been provided with a beta copy of the software, but keep in mind that as of the time of this recording, the software is not yet approved for RMC risk assessments. To open the software, the application, the .exe file, and the other directories within the zip file that you are provided must be located on the C drive of your computer. From there, you can create a shortcut to place on the desktop, or you can pin the application to the taskbar, but the program will not open unless the main application file is located on the C so let's go through a quick example of where all the files need to be located on your computer. First, navigate to the File Explorer or the Windows Explorer and open your C drive. On my C drive, I have a folder titled RMC Total Risk. Inside that folder, I've placed my beta version of the software. And in that folder, we have the file directories, the configuration file, and the application file or the executable file. We can open RMC Total Risk by double clicking the executable file within the C drive. Alternatively, you can right click and create a shortcut and place that shortcut on the desktop. That will allow us to access the program from the desktop without opening the file explorer. A third option is to right click and pin the program to the taskbar. I've already done that on my computer, so I have the option to unpin, but you will see the option to pin the task, the program to the taskbar. Now we have three options to open the program. We can open it from the file explorer, directly from our desktop shortcut, or from the taskbar. When we open the program, we will see RMC Total Risk. Now before getting into any of the functions or risk analyses, let's poke around the graphical user interface a little bit and get our bearings. The graphical user interface consists of a menu bar, a toolbar, and four window panes. The window panes are referred to as the Project Explorer, the Tabbed Documents area, the Properties, and the Message window. You may move, dock, hide, or close the window panes as you desire. The File menu provides essential file management functionality just as with any other piece of software. You can create a new project open an existing project, save or save as, open recent projects, or exit the application. The view menu allows you to unhide or open the window panes within the software. If you accidentally or intentionally close the window panes, the view menu is where you will go to make them become visible again. The project menu contains commands related to the project that you're working in. From this menu, you can create new functions or risk analyses for your project, or you can edit the project properties through the properties window. We'll discuss all the functions and risk analyses options later in the presentation. The tools menu provides tools for managing your project and personalizing your workspace. Clicking on options in the tools menu will open the options dialog that will allow you to personalize RMC Total Risk in various ways as you see fit. The windows menu allows you to close or activate the document windows. The active document will have a check mark next to it in the list of documents, and you can see all the open windows by clicking the Windows button, which will open the Windows dialog. From the Windows dialog, 
You can activate or save specific documents, or you can se select and close multiple documents at once. Since I don't have any windows open currently, my Windows dialog and Windows menu are empty. Finally, the help menu allows access to the user guide, the terms and conditions for use of the software, and the about RMC total risk splash screen. In RMC Total Risk, you can customize the position, size, or behavior of windows to create window layouts that work best for you. When you customize the layout, RMC Total Risk will remember your configuration and it'll take on the same configuration the next time you open the program. The Project Explorer is typically located on the left-hand side of the main window and it shows a graphical representation of the hierarchy of elements within your project. After you create a new project, you can use the Project Explorer to view, navigate, and manage project elements. Project elements are organized under the Hazards, Transforms, System Responses, Consequence, and Risk Analyses folder subheaders. Many menu commands are available from the right-click menu on the various items in the Project Explorer, including creating new elements, creating groups, or sorting the items in each folder. Double-clicking a project element opens that element for editing. The tab documents provides the editing and reviewing space for the various project components, including hazard transform response and consequence functions. The documents can be dragged by their tabs and can be pinned to different areas on the screen, or they can be free-floating. These actions can also be performed by right-clicking on the document tab. In the Properties window, Typically on the right-hand side of the main window, you see the properties for the project and the selected project elements. To access the element properties, open the element for edit. Some properties are common among all project elements, while other properties are unique to the specific elements that you're working on. Properties are organized into groups for easier navigation. When you click on a property, the property description will be placed at the bottom of the properties window. All risk analyses will be run from this properties window. The message window shows you errors, warnings, messages, and event logs regarding the current state of your project. If there are any errors in your project file, they're listed here in the message window. And then once you resolve an error, resolve a warning, or a message, the entry will be removed from the message window. RMC Total Risk contains four function types that are very similar to the functions that you learned about in module one. So a lot of this is going to be repeated information. Hazard functions describe the exceedance probabilities of various hazard levels, with examples being peak flow frequency, reservoir pool stage frequency, and seismic hazard curves. Hazard functions are almost always represented by continuous random variables. Transform functions are used to transform or convert the hazard levels from one type of function to another. An example would be converting a peak flow frequency function into a stage frequency function using a flow to stage rating curve. System response functions describe the conditional probability of failure for various hazard levels for potential failure modes. And finally, consequence functions describe the consequences of failure or non-failure for various hazard levels. For a given project in RMC Total Risk, the required functions for a risk analysis are hazard, system response, and consequence functions. Transform functions are optional inputs and are based on the specific needs of the project. Several methods are available to enter a hazard function into RMC Total Risk. To enter a hazard function, use the project menu and hover over hazards, or right-click the hazards folder in the Project Explorer. The available methods for entering a hazard function will then be displayed. The two most common options will be entering data manually via a tabular function or importing data directly from the Reservoir Frequency Analysis software, RMC-RFA. Let's walk through an example of entering a tabular hazard for our stage frequency curve. So we'll right-click on the hazard folder in the Project Explorer and click on Add Tabular Hazard. A pop-up box will show up prompting us to add a name to our hazard, which we are going to name Stage Frequency Tabular. We click OK, and then our Stage Frequency Tabular document is pulled up into the tabbed documents area. 
Next, we need to define the hazard type and the hazard units for our function. We can see that there are red boxes indicating that this is an area that needs our attention. There are also two messages or two error messages down in the messages window telling us that we don't have a specified hazard type or hazard units. So we come over here and we define our hazard type. We use a drop down menu for this and our stage frequency curve has a hazard type of stage and our hazard units are in feet. We can see once we entered those points in the red boxes have disappeared and two of our error messages have also disappeared from the message window. The next thing that we do is tell the program if our hazard is uncertain or if our exceedance probabilities are uncertain. If the checkbox up here is checked, then what we're saying is we have one exceedance probability, and when we have a distribution, we'll have several stages associated with that exceedance probability. Typically for our data, we have the opposite. We have a single stage, and we have a range of exceedance probabilities for that stage. So that's what I'm going to do for this function, and I'm going to use a PERT distribution. You can see that there's several other distribution options that you can select from, but for now I'm going to use a simple PERT. Now it's a simple copy and paste exercise. I've obtained data from my h, &H engineer for my stage frequency curve. I have a stage, 5th, 50th, and 95th percentile, and also an expected value. So what I'm going to do is select my data in Excel, copy it, come back over to total risk, and I'll simply paste it in. When I do that, you see that the stage frequency curve has been entered and is being plotted within RMC total risk. And I can check the expected values of this curve against the expected values that I obtained from my h, &H engineer by clicking on the dashed blue line and following that line down to my discrete stages where my exceedance probability is shown. I want to highlight that there is an option to do a PERT percentile Z and PERT percentile distribution. Typically, this is going to be a better fit when you have 5th, 50th, and 95th percentile data points, such as I do for this curve right here. There's currently a bug in the software when you try to enter in a PERT percentile Z distribution. When you enter your data points, you're going to see a whole bunch of errors. You can get around this by simply entering your data points, saving your project, closing total risk, and reopening. That will prompt the percentile Z pop or distribution to work correctly, but I'm not going to go through the trouble of doing that now, so we're just going to use a PERT. So now, after all the data has been entered, we see that the stage frequency curve is being plotted, and we see that there are no errors in the message window. This is a good distribution, and we're ready to move forward with it. The second common method that we'll use to create hazard functions is to import data directly from RMC RFA. But before we do that, you see in the Project Explorer that we have some asterisks that have shown up. This is indicating to us that we have unsaved data in our project. So I'm going to save this project as, and I'm going to name it RMC Total Risk Demonstration. When we do that, the asterisks go away, indicating that all of our data has been saved. So to import a hazard function from RMC RFA, we go up to the Hazard folder in the Project Explorer, right-click, and click on Add RMC RFA Hazard. In the box that pops up, we will name our hazard function. We'll call this one Stage Frequency underscore RFA. We will select the RFA project file that we're importing from using the three dots button, the browse button. We will find our project file, tell the program which output type we're looking for. In this case, we're looking for stage frequency. And then we will select the RFA simulation that we would like to pull from. And then we select OK. And we see that our data from RFA has been pulled in with uncertainty bounds. We set the hazard type to stage and the hazard units to feet, just as we did with the tabular function, and we are finished. So now we have an imported data series from RMC RFA for our stage frequency. We can look at this data in graphical format, or we can go up to the top of the window and select tabular results. And here we see 
the expected probability for our annual exceedance probability and the associated maximum, minimum, mean, and median stages for each of those probabilities that we pulled from the software. The next set of functions that we have are transform functions. To add a transform function, right-click on the Transforms folder in the Project Explorer. There's three different types of transforms that we can add. We can add linear transform, a power transform, or a tabular transform. Generally, for Damon Levy safety risk analyses, we will be using tabular transforms. I'm going to enter a transform to convert our stages from our stage frequency relationship into their equivalent discharges from the project. So I'll select Add Tabular Transform and assign it a name. We'll call this one Stage to Discharge. And click OK. And our Stage to Discharge window has popped up in our tabbed documents pane. What we need to do is we need to define the hazard type and units of our primary variable or primary hazard and then do the same thing for our transformed hazard and our transformed units. So my primary hazard type is from my stage frequency curve and it's stage and the units are feet. My transformed unit, my transformed hazard are flows, they're discharges. So my transformed hazard will be flow and my transformed units will be cubic feet per second. Next, we assign a distribution for our transform. You can assign any of these types of distributions here, but I'm going to select deterministic. I only have one equivalent discharge for each stage. So then after I've put together a stage discharge relationship outside of total risk, I take my data and I copy it and I simply paste it into the column and I come out with my stage to discharge relationship. Next, we move on to system response functions. When I right click on the system responses folder in the Project Explorer, I see five options for adding a system response function. We can add an event tree response, a parametric response, a tabular response, a bivariate response, and a composite response. We'll be using the event tree response in this demonstration, and it's going to be the response that we use most often in Dam and Levy safety risk analysis. This is the response function that most closely mirrors what we do during risk analysis today when we use RMC QRA calcs for quantitative risk calculations. A bivariate response can be used when we have a potential failure mode that's uh, a function of two separate hazards, such as seismic ground motion and reservoir stage. And a composite response is something that we can use when we have something like gate inoperability that affects our hazard for the project. Let's build an example event tree response and see what it looks like. So we select add event tree response and in the box that pops up we assign a name, we'll call this one example event tree one, and choose from a template. By default the basic template is selected which allows the user to build an event tree from scratch. Other templates can be selected using the drop down menu. The list of templates is currently limited but it includes a few common potential failure modes. We'll continue to build in more templates as we continue working with the software. When the event tree is created, we see the event tree workspace. The first thing that we do is look over at the properties window to see if there's anything that we need to address. And we see some red boxes that need our attention. We have to specify a hazard type and hazard units for the potential failure mode we're evaluating. This is going to be the variable that the PFM is a function of. For this example, we'll say that the PFM is a function of discharge. For hazard type, we'll select flow, and for hazard units, we select cubic feet per second. The event tree space is a powerful and flexible space for us to work in to create our event tree. We're able to zoom in and out of the space and pan around the space so that we can see the nodes of our event tree better. The basic template creates a one node event tree with a failure branch and a non-failure branch. And this is the starting point that we use to construct our custom event tree. To add branches to the event tree, we hover over the chance node or the end node that we want to add branches onto and click the green plus sign that appears over the mouse. 
Alternatively, we can add branches by clicking on the branch name and expanding the sub-branches list in the properties window. Under that sub-branches list, there's an option to add a branch with a green plus sign. We click that and we add another branch to that node. To copy branches, we hover over the chance node of the branch that we wish to copy and click on the copy all branches to clipboard icon. And then to paste, we hover at the end node where we would like to paste the branches and we click on the paste copied branches to this node button. When we do that, we see that the branch structure has been copied and pasted where we wanted it to go. To delete branches, we hover over the, change, the chance node at the beginning of the branch that we would like to delete and click the red X. So this is delete all branches from this node. Make a note that this is going to delete every branch that comes off of this chance node. So we click that and those branches are deleted from the event tree. Alternatively, we can delete individual branches by hovering over the branch name and clicking on the red X that says delete branch. So that's a way that we can delete one branch from a node if there are multiple branches and we don't want to get rid of all of them. To change the name of a branch, double click on the existing branch name and enter a new name into the dialog box that appears. Another way that we can change the branch name is to click on the node or click on the branch and change the branch name in the properties window. So we see here that node one is right here. So we can change that name to whatever we want it to be. If you have an event tree that you know that you're going to be needing for use for future projects, you have the ability to save it as a template in Total Risk. This will save it as a template to your local Total Risk software application so that you can use it for other projects moving forward. To save an event tree as a template, hover over the hazard and click on the branch properties or the little gear icon. In the dialog box that appears, click on the disk icon to save it as an event tree template in the program. Now that we have a feel for the event tree space, let's build an event tree for our, our example project that will feed into our risk analysis. We'll create a new event tree response with the name PFM1 with intervention. The reasoning for using with intervention in the name will become clear later on. And we'll use a basic template for this to start from scratch. PFM1 is an overtopping failure mode with four nodes. So I use the green plus signs to build a four node event tree. And this potential failure mode is a function of stage. So my hazard type is stage and my hazard units are in feet. Next, I assign each node a name. So node one is going to be titled node one. Node 2 will be titled Node 2, and so on and so forth. The only exception will be Node 3. Node 3 is my intervention node, and I'm going to specify in the, node, in the node name that Node 3 is for intervention. And again, the reason for that will be clear later on. I prefer to build the event tree structure before assigning any probabilities when I'm building an event tree. So that way I ensure that the structure of the event tree is correct first, and then I focus on entering my probabilities second. So next, now that we've constructed our event tree structure, we can move on to the, the nodal probabilities. But before we enter those, we have to specify the hazard levels that were elicited. This is important. In total risk, you have to spec specify the hazard levels first, otherwise the nodal probabilities for each node won't be able to be entered correctly. There's two ways that we can specify our hazard levels. One is to hover over the hazard name and click on the properties icon, which will bring up the hazard level table. And the other way is to click on the hazard name and add the hazard levels in the property window. The hazard levels can be entered manually within total risk. So you can type these in if you want to, or, um, you can copy and paste them from another program such as Excel. So if you're entering them manually, you have the ability to add and delete rows from the table at will, 
or if you copy and paste from Excel or another program outside of Total Risk, the tables will be pre-populated or populated automatically with however many data points that you have. So I have already populated my system response data in Excel in a format that Total Risk will like. So I'm going to be using the copy and paste method. A little bit of pre-processing of your data like this makes this process run much more smoothly. So I come over to my system response. I find all of my hazard levels that have been elicited and I copy them and paste them into the hazard level table. So now that I've done that, I'm ready to populate the rest of the event tree with my nodal probabilities. To enter probabilities for a node, again, you have two options. You can open the node properties dialog by clicking on the branch properties icon, and you can enter your probabilities in that way. Or you can click on the branch and enter probabilities in the system response section of the properties window. I generally default to entering them into the system response section of the properties window just because that's the way I learned the program, but either way is just fine and, and both ways will work. When you're ready to enter in your probabilities, you have a couple of different options that you need to define. The first is the source of your probabilities. So you use the drop-down menu to define the source of your probabilities, and there's a couple of different options. Single value can be used for stage independent nodes, where the probabilities for each hazard level are going to be the same. Where multi-value can be used for stage dependent nodes, where you have changes in probability based on which stage or which hazard level you're evaluating. Response functions can be used for complex event trees or for different applications, maybe where different components of the event tree are built in different spaces. So for example, if an intervention node is broken down into several different nodes for early and heroic detection and intervention, then the full intervention event tree maybe can be built as a separate system response function. And then the single intervention node in this event tree can be assigned the resulting probabilities from that separate, more complex event tree. So that's one way you could use the response functions. The distribution represents the distribution that is going to be used to sample the probabilities for the node. Now, typically, we're going to use a triangular distribution here or a deterministic uh, value for probabilities. Um, but there are multiple other distributions that you can choose from. And then finally, after we've selected our source and our distribution, we can enter our probabilities into the table. First, node one. So I come over to my um, separate spreadsheet and I see that node one is a deterministic node. There is no distribution, but I can't use a single value because my probabilities change. I have a zero point at 517.1 and the rest of my probabilities are different. So I come back over into total risk. My source is going to be multi-value. My distribution is going to be deterministic, and I copy my most likely values and paste them into my system response probability table. Next is node two. So I come back over and I see that my probabilities are changing for each hazard level. So I need to use a multi-value source, and I have a triangular distribution. So I copy those values. I come back over into total risk for node two. I select multi-value for my source, my distribution is triangular, and then I simply paste my values of probability in. We do the same thing for nodes three and node four. So node three also is a triangular distribution. And then node four is the same as node one. There is no distribution, but I do have a zero point, so I have to use a multi-value source. So that has it. We're done. We've entered our probabilities, we've created our event tree, and we're finished. So once you've completed assigning those probabilities, it's good practice to save your project to prevent losing any data. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And now we can explore some of the other features that Total Risk has to offer for event tree responses. Clicking on the response tab 
at the top of the window opens up a system response plot to show the system response as a function of pool with uncertainty. So this is where total risk is really going to start to shine. We're going to see it when we select the response tab and the diagnostics tab. So just as with any other of our plots in total risk, we can click anywhere along the plot and see what our conditional probability is. We can see what the mean probability is, and we can see what the values of probability are for our 90% confidence interval. So this provides a good gut check for our probability entries to ensure that we didn't enter anything incorrectly. If you're looking at this plot and you see um, maybe a, a point where your probabilities go down or you see something weird happening with your uncertainty bands, this can be a good spot to ask yourself, did I enter something incorrectly or is there something in my elicited probabilities that doesn't really make sense? To view even more statistics about the system response function, we click the diagnostics tab. And this window shows a host of statistics for the system response, including event likelihood, correlation of each node to the total system response probability, system response probability scatter, and a summary of tabular data. And this information is available by hazard level, and it's calculated via Monte Carlo sampling within the program. So total risk performs Monte Carlo sampling almost instantaneously. So whereas obtaining these statistics in RMC QRA calcs would require an at-risk simulation and would take some time to run, total risk provides them in real time to tell us just about anything we'd want to know about our system response probability. So let's say that we want to look at hazard level 522.1. We enter that in and we can see event likelihood based on each node. So for each node, we see how likely the event is for that hazard level. For the Monte Carlo iterations, we have an option to run 100, 1,000, or even 10,000 iterations. And it happens, like I said, almost instantaneously. We can check out the correlation to the system response. So what is having the highest correlation to system response? And in this case, it's node two. So we can see here that node two is our biggest driver of system response at that hazard level. We can also look at node system response scatter. For node one, there is nothing because the probability is one. So there is no scatter for node one. For node two, we can start to see that the sampled probability for node two, we can look at the sampled probability for node three. So we can see how much these nodes are correlated to the system response. And then finally, we have our tabular data. And this is the result of our Monte Carlo simulation for this hazard level. We can see for node one at 522.1, the probability is always one. We can see how node two is um, is being sampled in that Monte Carlo simulation. And sure enough, we go down here and we have 10,000 data points that have been produced for us instantaneously through this simulation. And we could take this data, we could select the table, we can copy and paste this data, we can export the data to Excel and manipulate it elsewhere. So the diagnostics tab really provides a lot of useful information that we can used to evaluate or analyze our potential failure mode or our system response probability to make sure that everything makes sense. Now we're going to go through the exact same process and build our second potential failure mode event tree for PFM2. So we'll go over to system response, add event tree response, we'll name this one PFM2. We'll still put with intervention in the title and click OK. PFM2 is a seven node event tree, so it's going to be a little bit longer than PFM1. Our hazard type is still stage, and our hazard units are still in feet. We have seven nodes, like I said before, so I'm going to add a branch and keep adding branches until I get to seven nodes. I'm going to use the same naming system that I use for PFM1. So node 1 is titled node 1, node 2 is node 2, and so on and so forth. Node 6 is my intervention node. I'm going to title it node 6 intervention. And 
finally node seven. All right, so now that I have my event tree structure, I have to specify my hazard levels that I'll be using for my nodal probabilities. So I already have those formatted. This is a potential failure mode that was evaluated for stages beginning at normal pools. So it's not an overtopping potential failure mode. It's a failure mode that we're looking at for normal pools. So my stages are a little bit different. So I copy those and paste them into total risk. So then I move forward to enter all of my nodal probabilities. Looking at node one, I have a triangular distribution and my probabilities are consistent across all of my stages. So that means I only need to copy one row. For my source, I can say single value. And for my distribution, I select triangular. And the format of the data changed a little bit. So my lowest reasonable value is 0 0.04, my most likely value is 0.15, and my highest reasonable value is 0.45. I can enter those in manually into total risk. So there's my triangular distribution for node one. Next, node two, and I have the same thing. Triangular distribution, but it's stage independent. So 0 0.1, 0 0.45, and 0.75. Single value, triangular, 0 0.1, 0 0.45, 0 0.75. Next is node three. Again, it's a triangular distribution, but this one is stage dependent. So I can copy and paste this data in. I have a multi-value source, triangular distribution, and I paste my probabilities in here. For node four, I also have a triangular distribution and I need a multi-value source. So for this one, I'll add the probabilities in using the dialog box just to show you what that looks like. So I select branch properties here I still have a multi-value. I can select my distribution right there as a triangular, and I paste my values in. You see that the values pasted there also populated over here in the properties window. So either way you do it, you come out with the exact same thing. Okay, next is node five. I'm back to a single value, single source, triangular distribution, 0 0.003, 0 0.008, and 0 0.075. So single value. Triangular, 0, 0.3, 0 0.05, zero, 0.075. Oh, 0.075. Okay. For node 6, I have multi-values, stage-dependent, in a triangular distribution. Multi-value, triangular, and paste. And finally, for node 7, I have the same thing. So for node 7, I select multi-value, triangular, and paste my data. So now I'm finished pasting in all of my data from my system response probability. But one thing that we need to look at is our interpolation transforms over here. This is where we tell the program how we want our data to be interpolated in the risk analysis. For none, the program is going to perform linear interpolation when it partitions our hazard levels and it interpolates our stage or our system response values. It's going to use linear interpolation to fill in or produce or obtain our system response probabilities for hazard levels between the ones that we specified in our system response probabilities. That may not be what we really want. If you recall from RMC QRA calcs, there's a couple of different interpolation options that we can use for potential failure modes. We can use linear interpolation or we can use semi-logarithmic interpolation. Those are the two most common interpolation methods that we use. For, node, or for PFM1, we're looking at an overtopping failure mode. And remember, for overtopping failure modes, a lot of times it's okay for us to use linear interpolation. For PFM2, we're looking at an internal erosion potential failure mode, and we'd like to use semi-logarithmic interpolation for this potential failure mode for the risk analysis. So what we do is for probability, instead of none, we use the drop-down menu and we select logarithmic. So when we have 
linear interpolation for the hazard and logarithmic interpolation for our probability, that's essentially saying that we would like to perform semi-logarithmic interpolation for the risk analysis for this potential failure mode. So we come over to the response tab and we check out our response for this potential failure mode. You can see that the probability is near zero for our lower pools and it quickly increases at least on the upper end for our higher pools. One thing that you can do if it's difficult to view your data with this plot, we're using a linear scale for the plot for the y-axis for conditional probability. You have the ability to change that. If you right click on the axis and click format axis conditional probability, you'll see that you have a lot of different options similar to how you can format a plot in Microsoft Excel. So one thing that we can do, we can change the axis type from linear to logarithmic. This way we can see how the spread looks in log space for our system response probabilities. So that's just one way that we can customize our plots in RMC total risk. For PFM2, we can also come over to the Diagnostics tab and we can take a look at all the same parameters and perform Monte Carlo analysis just like we did for PFM1. So we can look at how likely the event is for a specified hazard level. So if we look at the 513 hazard level, we can see how likely the events are. Node 1 is the most likely. What's the correlation to system response probability? We see that node five is controlling the system response probability or has the highest correlation to system response probability. Can look at sensitivity index, system response probability scatter. So if we look at node three, we would expect to see some pretty weak correlation based on what we're seeing here. And if we go over to node five, we'd expect to see a stronger correlation. And we do, it's not, overly strong, but it is a stronger correlation than we saw for node three. And then we can look at all of our tabular results for each iteration in the Monte Carlo analysis. So that completes both PFMs one and two with intervention for this risk analysis. Next, we'll do something to um, be able to perform the risk analysis without intervention. So when we do a risk analysis in RMC QRA calcs, we have the ability or the, the software is set up so that it automatically calculates the risk with and without intervention. Unfortunately, <clears throat> Total Risk currently does not have that capability, so we're forced to mess around with the program a little bit to get it to do what we want. This is the reason that I named PFM1 and 2 with the with intervention nomenclature. What I need to do is I need to reproduce these system response functions, but without the intervention node so that I can perform a risk analysis with and without intervention. And the way that I'm going to do that is simply by copying and pasting these system response functions and removing the intervention node from the event trees. How I do that, I go up to the property, the project explorer, and on PFM1, I click copy. That'll bring up a dialog box and it's asking me what I want to name my copied system response function. So I'm going to name it PFM1 without intervention. And when I do that, I see that PFM1 without intervention has been added to the project explorer. So the next thing that I need to do is remove the node three node from this event tree structure. Now, one thing to note if I remove the node three node, it's also going to remove node four. I need to be aware of that because I'm going to have to add node four back in. What I'm going to do in this case, I'm gonna click on node four and I'm going to make a note that I'm using multi-value and deterministic and I'm going to copy my system response probabilities from node four so that when I delete node three, I can quickly add node four back in and paste my system response values right there. So now I have created an event tree for PFM1 without intervention. So I'll do the same thing for PFM2 as well. So that way I have both of them and can run them both without intervention. So I copy my node seven probabilities. I'm using a multi-value source with a triangular distribution. I delete node six from the event tree, and then I add node seven back to the event tree. 
I select multi-value, triangular, and I paste my system response values for node 7 back in. So now I have event tree responses for PFM 1 and 2, both with and without intervention. Now that we've completed our system response functions, we move on to the final function that we have to define before we can build our risk analysis, and that's our consequence function. When we right-click on the consequences folder in the Project Explorer, we see that there are several different options for adding a consequence function. We can import data directly from LifeSim, we can add tabular consequence data, and we can create composite consequence responses. Adding live sim consequence data and adding tabular data are going to be pretty widely used, and we can use composite consequence responses for our exposure to weight our different exposure scenarios. Let's create a tabular consequence function for our example project. For this project, we have non-breach and breach consequences for both day and night exposure scenarios. So we'll need to create a total of four tabular consequence functions and two composite consequence functions. So we add a tabular consequence function and we'll name the first one non-breach underscore day underscore tabular. This brings us to the tabular consequence function window. The first thing we need to do is specify the function properties over in the properties window. The non-breach consequences for this project are a function of stage. So the hazard type is stage and the hazard units are feet. We also need to specify the type of consequences that this function is representative of, life loss or economic cost. This function is for life loss, so the consequence is life loss and the consequence unit is lives. Next, we select the appropriate distribution for our life loss data that we've obtained from our economist. For this example, I'm going to use a PERT distribution. You can also use a PERT percentile distribution if you only have access to the 5th and 95th percentiles of the life loss data set. In my case, I have access to the true min and max, and I'm going to use the PERT, but there are several other distributions that you can choose from. Finally, we either enter the life loss data manually within the software, or we copy and paste from another source. As with our previous functions, I've pre-processed my data in Excel, so I'll copy and paste it in. So I go to Excel and I find my non-breach day life loss data. And I copy my stage, minimum, most likely, and maximum. And then I come into total risk and I simply paste those values into my table. The results of the distribution are plotted alongside the data for your reference, just as with all the other functions. So you can use this plot as a good gut check to make sure that everything is entered correctly and all the relationships between your data points and your hazard levels look okay. So now we follow the same procedure to create tabular consequence functions for non-breach night, breach day, and breach night. We could create a new tabular consequence function from scratch if we wanted to, or we can simply copy the tabular consequence function that we just made for our non-breach daytime life loss and rename it as date non-breach night tabular. The benefit of doing it this way is that all of our function properties are carried over from the original. So we don't have to set the hazard type or units, the consequence type or unit, and we don't have to define the distribution if we want to use the same distribution for our non-breach night as we're using for our non-breach day. So it saves us a little bit of time. Now we follow the same procedure. We come to Excel, copy, and paste the data into total risk. And we can follow the exact same procedure for our breach tabular consequence functions as well. So we'll rename this one breach day tabular. We find our breach daytime life loss data, copy and paste. And then we do it one more time for the breach night life loss. So breach night tabular, copy our data from Excel and paste it in. Once all the tabular functions have been completed, we now need to create composite functions to account for our day and night exposure scenarios. So I right click on the consequence folders in the Project Explorer and I click Add Composite Consequence. I'll create the non-breach composite first and name it non-breach underscore tabular. 
Once again, we have to specify the hazard and consequence type and units. So hazard type is stage, units are feet, consequence is life loss, and consequence unit is lives. Next, we have to specify the, comp the composite type that we would like to use. We do this using the drop-down menu in the properties window, and there are three different options that we can choose from. The additive option simply adds the consequence functions together. The average option averages the values from the different consequence functions based on their weights and then samples that average function. The mixture option samples the functions as a mixture distribution. This option will typically be the best option for life loss exposure as it's going to sample the data most appropriately. So I'm going to select mixture from my composite type and then I need to use the button with green plus signs to add rows to my composite function table. In this case, we need two rows, one for day life loss and one for night life loss. Use the drop down menus within the table to select the appropriate tabular consequence functions that we created earlier. So in this case, I'm going to select non breach day tabular and non breach night tabular. Finally, assign the appropriate weight for each function. My daytime life loss has an exposure rate of 0.45, and my nighttime exposure weight is 0.55. Once assigned, the composite function will plot within the document window for your reference. So again, you can use this as a gut check to make sure that everything looks right. So that's our non-breach tabular composite function, and I'm going to create a breach tabular composite function. I could copy the non-breach tabular if I wanted to, just as we did with our other top tabular functions, but I'll create another one from scratch just so you can see it one more time. So this one will be called breach tabular. Specify the hazard type, the consequence type. We're going to use a mixture again for our composite type. Add two rows to the consequence function table. Select breach day tabular and breach night tabular and assign our weights. And there's our breach life loss composite function. So now we have a non-breach composite function and a breach composite function that will feed directly into our risk analyses. Next, let's walk through the same process of creating consequence functions, but import the data directly from LifeSim. Right-click on the consequences folder in the Project Explorer and click Add LifeSim Consequences. Assign a name to your consequence function. For this one, we'll call it non-breach underscore day, underscore life sim, and then find and import the life sim project file that you want to pull data from. Do that by clicking on the button with three dots to browse your computer's file directory and select the appropriate life sim project file. Click OK to start the import process. And it'll take a few seconds for the model to import into total risk. So we'll wait for that to happen for a few seconds. And then once the life sim consequence window pulls up, the first thing that we need to do is assign the function properties. So we have a hazard type of stage, hazard units of feet. Now we need to populate the life sim consequences table. Click on the button with the green plus sign to add rows to the table. We see that there are three inputs that need to be specified, a hazard level, a simulation, and a distribution. The hazard level is a manual input and it has to be assigned for the import process to work correctly. For my first hazard level, I have a reservoir stage of 490.4 feet. Next, use the drop down menu to select the appropriate simulation from LifeSim that you need to pull your data from. In many cases, this list is going to be long and fairly cluttered and it may be difficult to understand, particularly if you don't have much experience with LifeSim. You'll need to be in close communication with your project economist to assure that you're selecting the correct scenarios. Another option that can make the selection process a little bit easier is to check the filtered view checkbox. This option splits the single simulation drop-down menu into three different menus, a simulation menu, an alternative menu, and a hazard time menu. I found this to be a more intuitive way of selecting the appropriate scenario, so I like to do it this way. My first hazard level is under the low pools simulation, and my alternative is 490-NB. For hazard time, I select 1400 to correspond with the daytime scenario. Finally, you need to define a distribution for your selected alternative. 
By default, a truncated normal distribution is assigned for all LifeSim scenarios, but if you click on the distribution button, a dialog box opens up which allows you to assign a different distribution, examine the goodness of fit of the distribution, and see the raw data that's being pulled from LifeSim. In the case of my first hazard level, there is no life loss, so this dialog box isn't particularly informative, but we'll take a look at it again for one of the higher hazard levels so you can see it in more detail. We follow this procedure until we've completed the life loss table. My life sim curve is going to have six hazard levels, so I need to create an additional five rows from the table. My remaining hazard levels are 495, 504.4, 513, 517.3, and 527.5. Next, I select the simulations for each hazard level, and each of my remaining hazard levels are in the same simulation called All. Then I assign alternatives for each hazard level. So my next alternative is SSNB. Following that is TAS. After that, I have IH, and then MH, and then finally, I have 1.5 times the PMF with a parapet for non-breach. Finally, I select 1400 for all of my simulations and alternatives so that I have my daytime curve. Now I can see that my data has been plotted in the life loss graph, but my confidence interval shading isn't displaying. And additionally, I see that I have an error message in the windows or in the, in the message window. The error says that the starting hazard must be a valid number and it has to be lower than the minimum level defined in the function. The starting hazard is the hazard level at which consequences begin to occur. Since my life loss data set contains a zero point for my consequences, I simply set the starting hazard to a, sl a stage slightly below my lowest hazard, so I'm going to assign it a value of 490.3. Now let's take a, look, a closer look at the distribution dialog box for a higher hazard level. Let's look at the intermediate high pool, or IH pool. When we open the dialog box, we can see that it's been populated with a histogram of life sim results and a PDF of the selected distribution. Now, this allows me to compare the fit of the distribution to the life loss data and determine if a different distribution yields a better fit. You can also view the raw data like I said, for the distribution and the life sim model by clicking on the statistics dropdown. But there's one thing in particular that we need to keep in mind and, and take caution with when we're changing distributions. By default, like I said, the assigned distribution is a truncated normal distribution that's truncated such that the minimum value of the distribution will never be less than zero, and the maximum value of the distribution will never be greater than the maximum life loss value from the life sim data set. When assigning other distributions, those same truncations will not be present. So for example, if I select a PERT distribution, the minimum life loss value for the distribution is less than zero. That isn't what we want. Now, when we select other distributions, we still have some customization ability. We have the ability to manually adjust the parameters of the distribution if we would like to. So in this situation, I recommend that the minimum life loss be assigned a value of no less than zero. And that way, you can assure that you won't ever get negative breach or non-breach consequences. On the other hand, selecting an LN normal distribution results in a maximum life loss value of infinity. The probability that life loss values greater than the life sim maximum being sampled, it's pretty small for this distribution, but it does go to show that we need to take care when assigning these distributions to ensure that the data that we're using in the risk analyses fits reality. So I'll change that back to a truncated normal distribution, and that finishes our first life sim consequences function. So the next steps are to follow the same procedure to create the non-breach night, the breach day, and the breach night scenarios. So when we were doing our tabular life loss functions, we could simply copy and paste a, a new function and then change the inputs. When we're 
importing from LifeSim, it's best practice to create a new LifeSim function from scratch. So that's what I'll do. Right click on consequences, I'll add a new LifeSim function. We'll call this one non breach night LifeSim. And I will import my LifeSim file. Once my LifeSim function window opens up, I again specify my hazard type and my hazard units. I already know that I have six stages in my life loss curve. I can go ahead and add six rows. I can copy and paste my hazard levels from my non-breach day function to my non-breach night function. And then I have to go through the song and dance of selecting all of the appropriate simulations, alternatives, and hazard times, just like I did for my non-breach day scenario. So I have 490, security scenario, top of active storage, intermediate high pool, max high pool, and my 1.5 times the PMF. And now since this is my nighttime curve, I select two, two in the morning for my hazard time so that these values are reflective of the nighttime scenario. Finally, I changed my starting hazard. I'm gonna use the same value of 490.3. And there you have it. I have my non-breach nighttime life sim curve. So I'll do this two more times. Let's create the breach day life sim curve. I'm pulling all of these data sets from the same life sim file. My hazard levels for the breach life loss are going to be the same as my non breach life loss functions. This is something you need to pay attention to. That may not always be the case. For simplicity, I'm using the same hazard levels, so I can simply copy and paste my hazard levels over into the breach function. And I'm going to be using all the same scenarios. When I go to select my alternatives, I'm no longer going to use the 490 non-breach function. I'm going to use the alternative 490 breach with minimal warning time. And I'll do the same thing for all of my other alternatives as well. So security scenario with minimal warning time, intermediate, uh, I'm sorry, top of active storage, intermediate high, max high, and one and a half times the PMF. This is my daytime curve. So selecting 1400 for the hazard time. And my starting hazard is 490.3. Then let's do this one more time. Reach night life sim. Import my life sim file. Specify my hazard type and my hazard units. Add my rows. Copy my hazard levels. Select the appropriate simulations. The appropriate alternatives. And finally, this is my nighttime curve. So I use the two o'clock hazard time. And set my starting hazard to 490.3. So now we have all four of our life sim curves for non-breach day and night and breach day and night. And we need to finish the process by creating composite functions for the life sim consequences, just like we did for the tabular consequences. So the procedure is exactly the same as we did before. We right click on consequences and add a composite consequence. We'll call this one non-breach underscore life sim. Specify the hazard type and the consequence type. We're still using a mixture composite type. 
add two rows to our consequence function table, and select the non-breach day life sim and non-breach night life sim. Make sure that you're selecting the appropriate consequence functions when creating your composite. And the daytime exposure weight is 0.45 and nighttime is 0.55. And then we have our composite function for non-breach using our life sim consequences. We follow that procedure one more time. We'll call this one breach life sim stage feet life loss and lives for our hazard types and units still using a mixture at our two rows looking for breach day life sim and breach night life sim 0.45 for day weight 0.55 for night weight so now we have four tabular consequence functions four life sim consequence functions and we have our four composite life sim or our for composite consequence functions that will feed directly into our risk analyses. So we'll save this. And now we're finished with consequences. Now that we've created the hazard, transform, system response, and consequence functions, we're ready to start building our risk analysis. To start a new risk analysis, right click on the risk analysis folder in the Project Explorer and select Add Risk Analysis. In the dialog box that opens, assign your risk analysis a name. I'll call this one PFM1 underscore tabular underscore tabular. Select OK to create the risk analysis, and we see the risk analysis window pops up in the tab documents window. Just as with the other functions, there are some items in the properties window that we need to address. We need to specify a consequence and a consequence unit for the risk analysis. Now this input tells total risk what type of consequence functions to look for in the risk analysis. The consequence type that's specified here must match the consequence units that are input into the risk analysis, otherwise the analysis won't run. The properties window is also where we are going to run the simulation from. There are two options for running a simulation. We can simulate the mean risk only, or simulate risk with full uncertainty using a Monte Carlo simulation. The properties window also contains risk analysis options in the options tab. The simulation options submenu contains settings for the risk engine. The confidence interval defines the interval that's used to process uncertainty in the Monte Carlo simulation. For a 90% confidence interval, the value of interest lies with a 90% probability within the interval. The number of realizations determines the number of Monte Carlo iterations for the analysis. Just as with RMC QRA calcs, it's recommended to run 10,000 realizations to get accurate 90% confidence results. The pseudo random number generator is the seed value used within the Monte Carlo simulation, and the big FN output length is the number of N levels that are used to construct the big FN curves. The more end levels, the greater the accuracy, and it's recommended to use at least 100 intervals to improve the accuracy of the risk estimates. The integration options represent the maximum number of integrand evaluations that are allowed when performing numerical integration, the maximum recursion depth when performing adaptive Simpson's, method in Simpson's rule integration, and the desired absolute tolerance for the adaptive Simpson's rule integration. These options are locked by default, and they can be edited by unchecking the Use Defaults box, but for most situations, the default options should be used. The System Component options specify how the elements within the risk analysis should relate to each other. The System Component dropdown is used to specify which system to assign the options for. If the risk analysis only contains a single hazard, it will be the only entry in the drop-down list. The failure mode method dictates how the potential failure modes in the risk analysis will be combined. There are three options, common cause failures, competing failures, and joint failures. The common cause failures option applies the common cause adjustment to potential failure modes in the risk analysis that are not mutually exclusive. 
The competing failures option applies the competing risk model to potential failure modes and assumes that each potential failure mode progresses independently of every other one until failure occurs. The joint failures option applies the joint risk model, allowing for dependency between potential failure modes and the occurrence of simultaneous or joint failures. When the joint failures option is selected, an additional option appears for joint consequences. This determines how joint failures are handled in the risk analysis, and there are four options, additive, average, maximum, and minimum. The additive option adds the consequences for joint failures together within the risk analysis. This is a good option if the potential failure modes result in inundation and consequences in separate consequence centers. The average option will average the consequences of failure when multiple failures occur. The maximum option uses the maximum consequences when joint failure occurs. This is a good option if the potential failure modes result in inundation and consequences in the same consequence center. Finally, the minimum option uses the minimum consequences when joint failures occur. The profile hazard type specifies which hazard will be used to construct the risk profile plots for the risk analysis. And the hazard threshold specifies the hazard level which sets the zero point for probability of exceedance or annual probability of failure for the risk analysis. Only the probability of hazard levels exceeding the threshold will be recorded in the risk analysis results. And this hazard threshold is set to zero by default. The system options define how the risk analysis will operate when calculating the risk for a system, such as when you have multiple hazards or multiple structures. The component dependency allows the user to specify the system components correlation, how the system components are correlated, and the joint consequences specify how the risk analysis handles joint consequences, just as it does for the system components. Finally, the risk measure options are used for assessing user-specified measures of risk. The consequence threshold sets the zero point for probability of consequences in the analysis and is set equal to zero by default. The alpha represents the exceedance probability or annual probability of failure for computing the value at risk and conditional value at risk for the analysis. Now let's build a risk analysis for PFM1 using the tabular stage frequency function and the tabular life loss functions. First, we go back to the general tab in the properties window so that we can define the consequence and consequence unit for the analysis, which in this case, the consequence is life loss and the consequence unit is lives. To begin the building process, we need to add the elements of the risk analysis to the risk diagram, beginning with the hazard. There are two ways to add a new hazard to the risk diagram. Right click anywhere in the risk diagram and select add hazard, or hover over the green plus sign and select hazard. A box for our hazard appears in the risk diagram. Boxes for hazards have a blue header and contain the hazard symbol in the upper left hand corner. The hazard box is surrounded by a dashed and dotted line that indicates the elements that are captured within our risk analysis. As we continue to add elements, the black line will expand to encompass them. You'll notice that the drop-down menu is highlighted in red. This indicates that the element in question does not have any input associated with it. We use the drop-down menu to select a hazard. In this case, we select stage frequency tabular. The next step in the building process, if applicable, is to add transform functions to transform the hazard variable to another variable. We don't need any transform functions for this risk analysis, but I'm going to insert one for your reference. There are three ways that elements can be added to the risk analysis at this point. The first way is to right click within the risk diagram and add them. The second is to hover over the green plus sign. And the third is to click on a node output connector for an already existing element. The first two methods require an additional step to connect the new element to an existing element, while the third method automatically connects the new element to the output connector of the existing element that was used to insert it. 
I'll use the third method and add a transform element to the risk analysis. Transform elements have a light yellow header and contain the transform symbol of two crossing arrows. Using the, stage, using the dropdown, I'll assign the stage to discharge transform function that we defined earlier. The hazard element and the transform element are now connected within the risk analysis by a solid black line. This indicates that the units between the two elements match and there is nothing wrong with the connection. You can see which units are being represented by the elements at the node outputs and inputs. For the risk analysis to work proper properly, the unit at a given element output must match the unit of the element input that it's connected to. To give you an example of what it looks like when the connections are incorrect, I'm going to add our non-breach consequences to the transform element. So I click on the node output connector from the transform and add a consequence. In the consequences dialog box, I select non-breach tabular. In this case, the output unit of the transform function of flow does not match the input units of the consequences of stage. So when a connection between two elements is not valid, the line connecting them will be red. This occurs when the units don't match or when an input has not been defined. Since we don't need the transform function for this risk analysis, I'll delete it. You can delete elements of the risk diagram by hovering over them and clicking on the delete button, the, the X in the top right corner of the box. In order to correctly calculate non-breach risk and incremental consequences due to breach, we have to define the non-breach life loss relationship within the risk analysis. So in order to do that, we need to link our composite non-breach consequence function directly to the stage frequency curve or the hazard curve for the risk analysis. So to do that, I click the output connector of the hazard function and click add consequence. The consequence box appears and consequence function boxes have green headers and are marked with a green circle and an exclamation point. And then using the drop down menu in the consequences box, I select the non breach tabular composite function that we defined earlier. You don't need to put the non breach consequence function at the top of the risk diagram like I've done here but I like to put it into the diagram first so that I know that I've included it. You can place it wherever you'd like within the diagram as long as it's directly connected to the hazard. Once I add the non-breach consequence function, the line that links the two analysis elements turns green. Green lines between elements indicate that all the links between the risk analysis elements are valid and a simulation can be performed. However, we haven't defined the entire risk analysis, so we don't have any system response functions yet. To add the system response function for PFM1, I again click the output connector from the hazard. And this time I click add response. A response function box appears in the diagram. Response function boxes have a dark yellow header and are marked with a yellow shield in the top left corner. So then from the drop down menu, I select the appropriate system response function for the risk analysis. For this analysis, I'll select PFM1 without intervention. Once I select a response function, the lines between the risk elements turn black, so I know I don't have any unit mismatches or errors, but I also don't have enough elements to run the analysis. The last thing that I need to do is define the consequences in the event of a breach for PFM1. And to do that, I click on the output connector from PFM1 and click Add Consequence. In the Consequence function box that pulls up, I use the drop-down menu to select Breach Tabular, the composite consequence function that we created earlier. And when I do that, the links between the risk analysis elements turn back to green to indicate that all of the risk element connections are valid. Now that we've defined the risk diagram and all the connections are good, we're almost ready to run the simulation. But before we do, we need to go back to the Options menu in the Properties window to make sure that our simulation options and system component options are what we want them to be. For the simulation options, we'll keep the 90% confidence interval and set the number of realizations to 10,000 to ensure that we obtain convergence. The other options will leave the same. For the system component options, 
we'll use the competing failures option for the failure mode method. And we'll leave the rest of the options the same. For this analysis, the failure mode method doesn't really matter because we only have one potential failure mode. But for reference, we'll use the competing failures method for this analysis just as we will for the total project risk analysis. Now we're ready to run the simulation. Like I said earlier, there are two options to run a simulation. Simulate the mean risk only or simulate risk with full uncertainty. Simulating the mean risk only is a very powerful method that allows you to almost instantaneously obtain the mean of the risk calculation. To simulate the mean risk, select the mean risk only radio button and click estimate. And just like that, the mean risk has been calculated. You're now able to browse the results of the simulation using the summary plots and statistics at the top of the risk analysis window. We're going to cover each of those options more in depth in a minute when we run a simulation with full uncertainty. Simulating the mean risk only is a great tool to use for a few different applications. First, it's a fantastic feature to use during an elicitation because it allows you to easily plot the mean results of the elicitation without having to wait on an at-risk simulation. Another good application is when you're evaluating design alternatives for a structure and you want to quickly and easily compare the plotting position for each alternative. However, the drawback of running the mean risk only is that uncertainty in the risk estimate is not captured and you won't be able to take full advantage of the features located in the diagnostics tab in the risk analysis window. But it's still a very useful feature that I think we'll use quite a bit in practice. Simulating risk with full uncertainty takes a little longer than simulating with mean risk only, but it's still much faster than running a full simulation with uncertainty using RMC QRA calcs in at risk. To simulate with full uncertainty, select the simulate risk with full uncertainty radio button and click estimate. A status bar will appear next to the estimate button to keep you informed of the simulation progress. Runtime will vary based on the number of realizations you're running, the complexity of the risk analysis model, and the method being used to combine risks for multiple potential failure modes. But as you can see, the simulation is already complete, so it's much faster than anything that we can do with RMC QRA calcs and at risk. When the simulation finishes, we can move into the tabs at the top of the window to browse the results. The Big FN tab creates the Big FN chart for the risk analysis. The three lists at the left-hand side of the window are the same for the Big FN plot, the Alpha Eta plot, and the summary statistics. These lists allow you to select which risk types you would like to view on the plots and tables, the alternatives that you would like to view, and the specific system response elements from the current risk analysis that you would like to view. For risk types, you see five different options on the Big FN and Summary Statistics tabs. Incremental, Background, Total, Failure, and Non-Failure. In Total Risk, Incremental has the same definition as it does in RMC QRA calcs, Breach minus Non-Breach. However, Total Risk has renamed Non-Breach Risk as Background Risk. This is an important distinction that you need to remember. Total risk refers to the residual risk that we're accustomed to. It's equal to the incremental risk plus the background risk. Failure risk refers to the risk of the structure should it fail without taking into consideration any non-failure consequences. Basically, it's calculated the same as incremental risk, but uses failure consequences instead of incremental consequences. Finally, non-failure risk refers to the risk of the structure should it not fail. This is different than background or non-breach risk. Background risk does not take the probability of non-failure into account. It's only the probability of the loading multiplied by the non-failure consequences. Non-failure risk is equal to the probability of the loading multiplied by the probability of non-failure of the structure multiplied by non-failure consequences. Just as incremental risk plus background risk equals total risk, Total risk is also equal to the failure risk plus the non-failure risk. The program also allows you to select tolerable risk limits that you would like to see on the plot. The three options are none, no tolerable risk limits, the USACE tolerable risk limits, 
or the ANCOLD tolerable risk limits. If you would like to set risk limits that are not included in the dropdown, you can click the button with the pencil on it to set your own custom tolerable risk limits in the tolerable risk limit editor. This allows you to create a new set of limits and save them as a template for future use. The alpha eta chart is synonymous with the little fn chart that you've been dealing with during other modules of this course, which plots the annual probability of failure by the average incremental life loss. However, there are some important distinctions in total risk for this plot, mostly due to changes in nomenclature. Instead of the y-axis being referred to as annual probability of failure, or little f, it's referred to in total risk as exceedance probability, or alpha. Instead of the x-axis being referred to as average incremental life loss, or n-bar, it's referred to as the conditional mean, or conditional mean consequences, eta. Finally, the product of the exceedance probability and conditional mean consequences is referred to as the mean instead of average annual life loss. The Summary Statistics tab provides a useful numerical breakdown of risk metrics from the risk analysis. The table reports the system component, the risk type, the exceedance probability, or APF, conditional mean, or average incremental life loss, mean, or average annual life loss, and standard deviation. These metrics correspond to the mean values of the risk analysis, and they won't change if you simulate the risk analysis for mean risk only, or simulate with full uncertainty. The final tab provides several categories of diagnostics for the risk analysis, which are shown as vertical tabs within the window. The risk measure diagnostics provide the density of the selected risk measure calculated for the selected risk type, and it can help better understand how the risk measure is distributed when simulating with full uncertainty. The risk plots plot the exceedance probabilities or conditional mean consequences against increasing hazard levels. The risk profile plots can be filtered by system component and risk type. Make a note here that the plot is not cumulative as it is in RMC QRA calcs. The Assurance tab shows the assurance plot and summary statistics based on a user-defined profile hazard type and hazard threshold. This tab is intended to support NFIP evaluations. The Tornado plot allows you to visually assess how sensitive the risk results are to input functions at each hazard level. These are ranked from most sensitive at the top to least sensitive at the bottom. The XY plot allows you to visually assess the correlation between different system risk components and can be filtered by risk type, risk measure, and system risk component. Finally, the tabular tab provides tabular results for the risk analysis for the selected risk type and risk measure. These results can be exported, copied, or analyzed by right-clicking on a column and clicking Summary Statistics. You can see that there's a lot of different plotting and data analysis options available within the program, all available to you without the need to use a separate spreadsheet or piece of software. Now that we've created a risk analysis for PFM1 without intervention and taken a close look at the plotting and diagnostics options, let's create some additional risk analyses for the project. We'll start by building an analysis for PFM2 without intervention. This is going to look almost identical to PFM1 without intervention. So we'll name this one PFM2 underscore tabular underscore tabular. Hit OK. And then we will define our consequence of life loss and our consequence unit of lives. Go to the green plus sign and add our hazard. Stage frequency tabular. We need to define our non-breach consequences relationship. So we add a consequence function and we select non-breach tabular. This time we're adding a response function for PFM2 without intervention. And then off of PFM2, we add our breach tabular consequences. We go over to our options in the properties window 
For full uncertainty, we'll want to do 10,000 realizations. And we'll put that on competing failures just so it matches PFM1. And now we have a PFM2 risk analysis. Now let's build the total project risk analysis. So we'll name this one project underscore tabular underscore tabular. Click OK. Our consequence is life loss. Our consequence unit is lives. And now, just as with the others, we add our hazard first. Stage frequency tabular. And we define our non-breach consequence relationship. So we add a consequence function and select non-breach tabular. Now, instead of only adding one system response function off of the hazard, we need to add two to represent both of our failure modes. So we go to the output connector node for the hazard. We add a response and we select PFM1 without intervention. To add PFM2, we do the exact same thing. We hover over the output connector, we add another response, and we select PFM2 without intervention. We need to define co consequence relationships for both of these response functions separately. So for each one, we go to the output connector node, we add a consequence, and we select breach tabular. We do the same thing for PFM2. Add consequence and go to breach tabular. And now for our simulation options, we want to do 10,000 iterations. And this time, we do have more than one failure mode, so the method that we use to combine our failure modes matters. So we're still going to do competing failures. And now, for the total project risk, we'll go ahead and estimate. We'll wait for the simulation to complete. And just like that, we have the results for our total project risk. We can go to the big FN plot, and we can view the incremental risk for this analysis. If we expand the risk analysis submenu, we can also view each of the individual failure modes on the plot. So we have PFM1 in the green and PFM2 in the pink, with our total risk plotted in red. We can also plot our background risk and our total risk for the project. Or we can do failure and non-failure. Looking at the alpha eta plot, we have our total risk with uncertainty scatter. And again, if we expand the risk analysis submenu, we can put both of our failure modes on there. In red, we see PFM1 with the mean denoted by the red circle. And PFM2 is plotted in blue. Our total risk is represented by the red-pink diamond. If we move to our summary statistics, we automatically pr plot the total risk for the entire project. But again, by expanding the risk analysis tab and selecting failure modes, we can also look at all of the summary statistics for our individual potential failure modes. So we have the total, PFM1, and PFM2. Finally, moving to the Diagnostics tab, we can take a look at all of our risk measures for, or all of our diagnostics for the risk analysis. So we look at the risk measures for exceedance probability, conditional mean, and for the mean. We can look at risk profile plots for the incremental risk for exceedance probability or conditional mean consequences. We can look at the tornado plot for the incremental risk to see which variables or which risk elements our total risk estimate is most sensitive to per hazard level. So if we go down to normal pool at 490, we can see that PFM2, the probability of failure, and the PFM2 consequences are driving the average annual life loss or the mean. This makes sense since PFM2 is driven by pools that are around normal pool. When we get up to higher pools, we see that the Average annual life loss is driven primarily by the probability of the hazard. This also makes sense given how uncertain the probability of the hazard is and how certain the probability of failure is when we get to those high hazard levels. So that makes total sense. When we go to our XY plot, we can plot PFM1 versus PFM2 
to see how correlated they are. We can plot our total system risk by PFM1, and we see that we don't have a ton of correlation. We can also plot it by PFM2, and we can see that the system risk is highly correlated with PFM2. Finally, we can go to our tabular results and view our incremental risk, and we can take the results from this table for annual probability of failure or exceedance probability alpha, and we can paste this into Excel, or we can right-click and look at our summary statistics to view some summary, st summary statistics for the results. And if we scroll down, we see that our tabular results do indeed capture all 10,000 iterations that we've run. The last thing that I'd like to do is demonstrate how you'll need to set up an analysis to produce estimates with and without intervention. We've already created a total project risk analysis that doesn't take intervention into account. So all we need to do is set up an identical assessment using the with intervention system response functions that we created earlier. To create this risk analysis, we could create one from scratch, or we can right click on our project risk analysis and hit copy. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add the word intervention on the end of our new risk analysis. Now we have an identical risk analysis to our project risk analysis without intervention, but we want to include intervention. All we need to do is, in our response function boxes, use the drop-down menus to select the appropriate system response functions that do take intervention into consideration. So PFM1 with intervention and PFM2 with intervention. Now all we have to do is run a simulation and we can plot these two alternatives on the same plot. But one other thing I'd like to show you is the batch run feature in Total Risk, which is a really neat feature which allows you to simulate multiple risk analyses at once. To perform a batch run, right click on risk analysis and select batch run. In the dialog box that pops up, you select the risk analyses that you would like to run, or you can click select all. Make sure, that, make sure that you know if you're simulating your analyses for mean risk only or for full uncertainty is that will make a big difference in how quickly things run. For this example, I'm going to go back and switch everything to mean risk only for expediency. So I select each of my risk analyses and make sure that my radio buttons are on simulate mean risk only. Now I wanna run a batch, so I right click on risk analyses, hit batch run, I select all and I click estimate. And just like that, all four of my analyses have been run with mean risk only and I'm ready to view the results. To view my results without and with intervention on the same plot, I select one of the pertinent risk analyses from the project explorer and go to my plot of interest. So I'm going to select project tabular tabular and this represents my total risk without intervention. I come up to my alpha eta plot and I can see the total risk without intervention for the project. All I need to do to view the project risk, risk with intervention is expand the alternatives submenu on the left-hand side. From there, I find my project tabular tabular intervention risk analysis, and I check that box. Now, that risk analysis also shows up under the risk analysis submenu. I can expand it, click my failure modes, and just like that, I have my total risk and my PFM risk without and with intervention on the same plot. So I see my total project with risk without intervention is plotted here, and my total project risk with intervention is plotted here. I can do the same thing in my summary statistics. If I expand the alternatives submenu and I click project tabular tabular intervention. So now I see my project total tabular without intervention my project total with intervention, and each of my PFMs without and with intervention, respectively. And I compare all of the summary statistics right here in this single table. This concludes session five of the course. Be sure to complete the homework five to get credit for completing the session. In homework five, you're given an example project to set up an RMC total risk. And you're asked to set up the necessary risk elements and risk analysis to calculate the project risk. Once complete, 
please send your completed homework to rmctraining at usace.army.mil with the subject as DLS 105 Homework 5 to help us keep track of the submittals. When you submit your completed homework, please include the .tra total risk file in the email. Thanks in advance for your cooperation. If you have trouble with the homework, please reach out to the instructors through the email address on the screen or by emailing us directly. We'll go over the solution to the homework assignment during the live question and answer portion, which will be in a few weeks. Also, at the end of the live session, you'll be asked to take a short quiz so we can give you credit for your participation. If you miss the live session, a recording will be posted to the RMC website, and the quiz will stay open until the day of the next live session. Please check the course schedule for dates and times. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you again in a few weeks.